Known for its rich farmland, beautiful coastal scenery, and exceptional school system, Cape Elizabeth has become one of Maine's most attractive places to live. But how did it all begin? Pre-exploration, 1000 AD. The first inhabitants were Native Americans, the Abenaki, those who settled in the Presumpscot River Valley. They came to Cape Elizabeth in the summertime for fish and in the early fall for deer. Evidence of encampments have been found at Hannaford's Cove and Pebbles Cove. Artifacts and burial sites where bones of deer, fish, birds, and some small mammals that are now extinct have been discovered at these sites. Of course, the Native Americans were the first ones here. Um, but they, they lived a different lifestyle than we do. They moved around a lot, so they no, weren't always here. In 1604, the first recorded description of early European visitors was that of Samuel de Champlain. He wrote that they visited an island which is very beautiful in view of what it produces, for it has fine oak and nut trees, the soil cleared up, and many vineyards bearing beautiful grapes in their season. He called it Isle de Bacchus, now Richmond's Island. Captain John Smith sailed up from the Jamestown colony in 1614 and recorded the headland on a map he gave to Charles, Prince of Wales, later Charles I. On this map, Cape Elizabeth was named for Charles' sister, Princess Elizabeth, later Queen of Bohemia. In 1627, the first settler was Walter Bagnell on Richmond's Island, a trader from Marymount in Massachusetts. He treated the Native Americans deceitfully and was killed by the Native Americans in 1631. From 1622 to 1632, the Plymouth Council gave to Fernando Gorges and Captain John Mason the land between the Merrimack and the Kennebec Rivers. Gorges gave this land's property rights to Robert Trelawney in England, a businessman. Apparently the fish were very, very thick at that time, and so uh, he wanted a fishing station on Richmond Island. Open boats and shallops were built for the fishing industry. John Winter constructed buildings on Richmond's Island where men lived and worked. In 1641, Reverend Robert Jordan, another Episcopalian, arrived. The manager of the fishing station's name was Winter, John Winter, and uh, Jordan eventually marries Winter's daughter. John Winter died in 1645. Robert Jordan was left to act on his behalf. When Winter died, uh, Robert Jordan, through his then wife, uh, was able to uh, inherit all of Richmond Island, as well as most of what's Cape Elizabeth today. 1652 marked the beginning of the founding years of Cape Elizabeth. Massachusetts General Court ruled that Maine be part of the Bay Colony. So the, the early settlements were in Spoink, and that primarily was Robert Jordan and his family, uh, people who had been on Richmond's Island. June of 1675 marked the start of King Philip's War, where Native Americans raided many settlements along the Maine coastline. Robert Jordan's house was burned down, and he and his family fled to Portsmouth. In 1668, the King William's War began and ushered in the Decade of Sorrows. Both Native Americans and the French began their attack on the area. From 1690 to 1698, the area remained completely uninhabited by settlers. The whole territory of Falmouth, which included Cape Elizabeth, was devastated. In 1713, a peace treaty was signed in Portsmouth, putting an end to the French and Indian War. Spurwink was again settled by Dominicus Jordan in 1717, who returned after being captured by Native Americans. In July of 1718, roads began to be built, the first ones known as Old King's Highway, which stretched from Portland Head through Perputic and connected to roads leading to Boston. Some of the earliest Cape Elizabeth roads and footpaths were Spurwink Avenue, then called Hannaford's Road, Mitchell Road, then called Cape Road, Shore Road, and Barron Hill Road. 
Governor Dummer's War, also known as the Three-Year War, broke out in 1722. More trouble with the Native Americans arose, and raids continued through 1724. The war finally concluded in 1725. By 1753, there was more commercial trade present in Cape Elizabeth than in Portland at this time. On November 1, 1765, the second parish of Falmouth was granted to Cape Elizabeth, which included what is now South Portland. Cape Elizabeth was founded. Years of growth and development. The Revolutionary War began, and its effect on Cape Elizabeth resulted in the construction of a fort at Spring Point called Fort Hancock. Farming and fishing decreased, and most men and ships were lost at sea. A peace treaty was signed in France in 1783, putting an end to the Revolutionary War. Construction of the Portland Head Lighthouse began in 1787 at the directive of George Washington himself and was commissioned in 1790. The stones were local. There's the field stones from, from the, they were picked up on the shore on the land. That's, that's what the light is made out of, is the stones, local stones. In 1806, the British announced a blockade of the western coast of Europe and more issues with England arose. The construction and reinforcing of forts became necessary in 1808 because of these extended issues with the British. Once in 18, I think it was around 1808, uh, that the Hancock, Fort Hancock becomes Fort Preble. The new design of Fort Preble was described in an address on coastal defenses by President Thomas Jefferson. Then the War of 1812, ended all of that, and so by, 18, by 1814, we're back in business again. The citizens of Cape Elizabeth finally went back to their lives. In 1820, Maine separated from Massachusetts and became a state. Advances in Cape Elizabeth skyrocketed. The Pond Cove School District was built in 1859. In 1874, the new townhouse was built. Two areas of Cape Elizabeth disagreed on several issues. Southern Cape Elizabeth predominantly consisted of farmers who didn't agree with Northern Cape Elizabeth's desire to industrialize. The Portland Water District proposed to construct a water main with the town to pay for the costs. The two committees went north to Augusta with the proposal to split, and the legislature agreed to a divide. Northern Cape Elizabeth then became South Portland. The rest of Cape Elizabeth remained as it is today. Throughout the 20th century, Cape Elizabeth continued to make advancements, ever changing as the population rapidly grew. The town hall was built by William Murray and was finished on June 19, 1901. In 1925, an addition was built. And in 1933, the, the new high school at that time was built. It's now the middle school one of the middle school buildings, but that was the new high school in 1933. And the current high school was built in 1971. Fort Williams operated as a garrison through the Civil War and both World Wars, and it remained active until June 30, 1963. Cape Cottage Park, a first-rate hotel and trolley park, was constructed in 1898, complete with live theater stage, restaurant, and casino, for which Casino Beach is named, Cape Cottage attracted visitors from all over. The casino burned down in 1908. Railroads and trolleys were built, neighborhoods developed, and suburban locations increased. Cape Elizabeth's culture continued to grow, but the wide fields and rugged coast that first attracted settlers to this land stayed the same. 250 years after its founding, Cape Elizabeth remains restful and quaint, and the community active and strong. The past and present here unite beneath time's flowing tide, like footprints hidden by a brook, but seen on either side.